Okay, so welcome uh, to both of you. So you guys know these guys are two legendary figures um, at, at Middlesex. I mean, I mean they really are, and, and we're trying to, you know, preserve that uh, as much as we can of the heritage of the college and the founding of the college. Again, this is Max. This is Francesco. Uh, two of my honor students uh, who I have working on this project, and I guess you know, um, and you know, you guys can start out. But basically, you know, for each of you. Um, we'll start out with your own personal background, where you're from, where you were raised, your families, um, you know, and, and, you know, the path that eventually led you here. So, right, Max, go ahead. Um, so, can you state your names for the camera, please? I beg your pardon? Uh, can you state your names? State your names for oh. the camera. Jim Childs. Bill Nagel. And uh, where did you both grow up? Well, I was born in Massachusetts, but I was raised in... Uh, I was raised in, in and around Worcester, and then uh, I moved here because of my first wife. We settled in New Haven, and uh, I began working in New Haven. Eventually, I uh, was an employee for Connecticut Blue Cross in their public relations. I also wrote, um, I was the first um, film critic in Connecticut at the New Haven Register for three years in the early 70s. Um, and so that um, led me to coming here, actually. And what year were you born, Jim, if you don't mind me asking? When was I born? Yeah. I'm 84 years old. Okay, so 1939. I was born in 1939. Okay, and then what did your family do in Worcester? Uh, my back? family's from Hyannis. Oh, okay. All right. Cape, uh, yeah, Hyannis. Um, I am younger than Jim. I'm 81, so. <laughs> um, the good story is I was born in Lebanon and grew up in Egypt, uh, both of which are towns in Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, what part of Pennsylvania? Uh, Eastern Central, around Allentown, okay. if you know that name. Uh, yeah. So, uh, went to school at Muhlenberg, which is in Allentown, private liberal arts college. Uh, got a master's at Wisconsin. Uh, taught a year of uh, faculty assistant teaching at Pitt. Uh, what when took you to Wisconsin? From money. Money. Okay. <laughs> they gave me a scholarship. Um, for graduate school. For graduate school, yeah. Um, I actually wanted to go to Cornell, uh, got into Cornell, but they didn't give freshmen, uh, they didn't give um, first year graduate students any money. Okay. All right. And, and, and what's your background, Bill? Family background? Uh, mother, uh, both retail, uh, mother and father. Uh, Long time. You know, my father rose to be a manager in a department store, right. and my mother worked in retail sales until she was 93. Oh my goodness! And they were both from Pennsylvania as well. Both from Pennsylvania. Yep. And then, so you got the masters at University uh, of Wisconsin. Was Wisconsin, and then back to Pitt, and then to Muhlenberg again, where I taught. Two years after I graduated, which is really a wine blower, right, right. <laughs> uh, but they wanted a PhD, okay. um, so I started looking, and I went to community colleges in Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, and then I saw a really handsome offer from Connecticut, twice as much as I was making, mm. twelve thousand. Yeah. <laughs> so I was making $6,000 in 1966, wow. Yeah, wow. full time. Wow. And, and so <laughs> uh, just for perspective. So, so, so let's go there about the path into education and then ending up here with Jim Mayne. So you want to ask him? So um, when did you first arrive at uh, Middlesex? I beg your pardon? When did you first arrive at Middlesex? At when Middlesex. Did, 68. When did you first arrived at Middlesex? 68. Two years. I was the second graduating class. Yeah, and Would that be I correct. She was. He was the first, and I became. Well, anyway, sixty-eight. 
But, but how did you go from Blue Cross oh, oh. to... Oh, uh, oh. My brother-in-law, in fact, he, I believe he was a student of uh, Bill's, Fred Husband, mm -hmm. uh, was in the first graduating class. Okay. And my then brother-in-law. And uh, I was working at Blue Cross, and I, I enjoyed it well enough, but not that much. And uh, I said, Fred, is there anything... You know, any are there any openings at uh, at your college? Because I don't even know know whether I know it's Middle Texas. Or not. And he said, I think so. And so I called, and sh lo and behold, there were openings, and I came and was interviewed by Boris, and and the rest is that alleged uh, so-called history. Now, who is Boris? A big button. Uh, who is Boris? Boris Burak was the first. Uh, department chair in English and uh, Bill worked right under him yeah and then at the time that I uh, there were two of us uh, Doug Doug Page and I were hired together in 1968 okay. so you were around 30 then. I beg your pardon you were around 30 years of age when you started yeah here? yeah okay. yep. in 1968 yep and, and your degree again was in English oh yes English uh, I went to Southern I got my BA uh, there, uh, double major, history, English, and then uh, I got my MA there also. And ev ev eventually I got a sixth year there it's in order for the college, to have a re the college to have a reading teacher. That was some years after I got my master's. And Bill, when you were coming from Maryland to Connecticut, can you just tell us what that process was, was like getting, you know, integrated into Middlesex's department? <laughs> okay. So when I came in 1967, there were three faculty members. <laughs> and probably five or six administration. It was the president, dean of faculty, dean of students, registrar. Maybe Merrily was there. I don't know. Was Let's see. There was Vader and there was Vader and, uh, Biggs and, Biggs, uh, and uh, the two deans. Uh, wasn't anyway. Oh. That that was it. Um, and three faculty members. And three faculty members. In the faculty My year, members. I think we gained. I think there were nine of us or six of us. I can't wow. remember whether six came and made nine or whether it was nine new ones. Within just a few years. The English department alone had 11 or 12 full-time yep. yep. people and as many part-time people. Yep. It just mushroomed. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There was so much interest. Uh, but I think from my perspective, the really compelling thing about the early years was that nothing existed here. We were in a high school after the high school let out. <laughs> <laughs> Our offices were in a little white cape across the street. Um, well, they weren't offices. Well, Remember? they weren't offices. Yeah, we didn't have one. Where the president oh, that's where we picked up on. Uh, there was a switchboard <laughs> there. Um, but there was nothing, <laughs> sitting here in this studio is hilarious. You know, yeah. There wasn't a catalog. Yeah. Uh, the president asked me, you know, again, anybody who had two legs got asked to do a lot of things. Yeah. You know? uh, so I was in English, so I did the catalog. Um, we didn't have any academic policies. Course lists were probably mimeographed or Xeroxed and handed out to students when they showed up. Um, so. And we formed what was called the Faculty Senate to vote on things so that we could have a vote. Um, so what, what is sort of expected these days uh, was all made up. Suppose you got a 1.8 in your first year. What happens to you? We had no, in the early years, there was no policy to govern that, so we had to say, Okay, you'll be on probation. What do you have to do to, you know, how many courses can you yeah. take you know, while you're on probation? Uh, can you take five courses and be a full-time student? Uh, yeah, uh, or are you limited to four? All of those things had to be figured out 
voted on, put it in the catalog because they didn't exist here. We were originally a satellite of Manchester Community College, uh, not independent for the first two or three years. I think maybe. No, when I came, we were separate. And we that, was separate. Okay, that was because of Wilbert Snow. Okay. That was the first year we had independence. Uh, so as, as an institution, Manchester probably couldn't care less what we did, so we did what we wanted to do. Yeah. So all the culture that now exists started with a little acorn yeah. <laughs> and just sort of grew in. Uh, we were present at creation. Yep. Right. Yep. Really. <laughs> And he especially, yeah. because those first two years were really seminal. And who else was on the faculty? Was, was, was there anyone on the faculty during those early years that endured for a lot of years? When you mentioned there were three yeah. or four or five? Yeah. Do you remember who they were? Uh, Harry Cunha. Harry Cunha in business. Um, okay, so in science, Skip Wiley, Wiley Peckham, Evie Moulton. Yeah, no, I don't think Coggins she... was in, uh, Dean Coggins was a biologist uh, and taught biology for years and years and became Dean. Um, hmm, where are the names? Uh, so, um, Math, Frugali, uh, not as familiar with math people. Um, no, well, Rodenheiser. Uh, Rodenheiser, Carl, yeah, uh, Carl, Carl Rodenheiser. Rodenheiser. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there, you know, uh, Pete Blum in business. Yep. Yep. Um, um, history and social sciences. Patrick, Serb. Um, but it all depends on when, when, for example, Serb came when I when yeah. I arrived in 68. Yeah. So. But they were here for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Uh, Lee Barnes. Uh, oh, yeah, Lee Barnes, uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Wow. Now, yeah. earlier you mentioned uh, Snow. What was he like as a person? A big pun? Uh, what was Snow like as a person? I heard you mention I don't know. Uh, uh, Bill would probably know. I, no, I, I met him, I that's all. Yeah, uh, I, I think we probably shook hands at some yeah. sort of ceremony, but, you know, he was quite elderly at that yeah, And he, he was a friend point. of uh, Robert Frost. Yes. Uh, and so Robert Snow was a poet a, as well, right? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, he had a published poetry. Yeah. 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 And so was there a sense of mission during those early years? Or was well, it yeah. everyday survival? Or? Uh, not survival so much. We, we figured we could do it. Um, and then the state pitched in and gave us three buildings at CVH. What year was that? Mm. Or, or, or how long? Uh, four or five years in, you know, probably yeah. early 70s. Uh, okay. One of them was Stanley Hall, which was the old maximum security prison. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> that was, <laughs> uh, my office was in a cell. And mine was in a cell. And there was a little hole in the corner. Yeah. Uh, you can imagine what the hole was for. Um, I mean, the walls are this thick. And they, it smelled in the summer. Uh, um, but that was the faculty and administrative offices were in Stanley Hall. Uh, uh, what happened to the Cape House? Um, well, his, uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, the driving force was Philip Wheaton, yeah. uh, plain yeah. and simple. He, and he not Phil only Wheaton is a, tell us who Philip Wheaton was. Well, yeah. he's the first president <laughs> yeah. of, of the college, yeah. Yeah. and he had been, I think, a dean at Manchester, and then became the first president. And we were in that little structure, that little Cape Cod house on Huntington Hill Road. Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly, someone, some maybe you or some member of the faculty said, Wheaton really wants to get us out of the Cape Cod house mm -hmm. to get. Up at uh, uh, what's the institute? Whiting is it Whiting? Um, Wherever. Well, CVH, yeah. Yeah, CVH. Yeah. One of gets us CVH yeah. to force the state to get us out of CVH <laughs> into a. I mean, because it was an embarrassment, really. But on the other hand, it, it really was useful in a number of other ways, uh, uh, pedagogically. Okay, 
But nevertheless, that was his, uh, I think that was his plan. Get us into a place that's embarrassing. Right. Yeah. And, to, and, that's, and so it took about, uh, uh, I was, I arrived in 68, so I think maybe um, uh, 72 or something, we finally moved yeah. into this, into these yeah. buildings. What was the moving process like when you- I beg your pardon? Uh, what was the moving process like when you- moved Moving? Out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like when you moved from the Cape House to CDH, what was that? Well, there wasn't much to move. I mean, we had uh, we had we had two sessions in the high school, and beside the high school was the library, which was a large um, what uh, trailer. That's really what it was. And he could, we had about a double trailer, and Ian oversaw the library, and so we didn't use the high school's library. But that's but again the. Uh, the Cape Cod house really was, it wasn't for faculty. I mean, we went in to pick up our folders or something yeah, of that the sort. The faculty didn't have any office. We had no office again. Yeah. And, and let me ask about the library. So I'm, I'm assuming Ann Penfield was the one who ordered the books right. for that library. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so Middlesex Library started as a trail. Yeah, uh, I mean, you just Where have to realize that there was, yeah. Right. No, it was parked beside the uh, high school buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in answer to your question, the move in <laughs> my memory was mostly about protecting the boxes of paper, so, you know, computer files. Yeah. So every every student's record, right, that's anything right, yeah. you can imagine, was in a folder in a box, right. and. They were moved to what no longer exists. There was another White House uh, here on the corner when you pull into the uh, uh, the driveway, um, uh, and they were all stored in there and just stored in there. Yeah. And eventually, I think the roof started to give way and <laughs> the rats. Was <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but there was we had no offices, so there were no desks to move or anything of that sort. Yeah. I mean, it's, when I say that we started from scratch, you know, uh, I mean, it's literally true. Uh, we had to move our briefcases. <laughs> yeah. And, and so. how many faculty were there when you went to CDH, more or less? I mean, how many faculty had to have off? Quite a few, because 68, again, was all that entitlement money. Yeah. I mean, we, we came in, I, I can't remember that, 68, there were about 15 of us hired. I mean, it yeah, was it amazing. Just, it really grew. I mean, I, if we were an established school, I think we would, you know, both of us would yeah. remember, okay, we got two that year, yeah. you know. Right. <laughs> Something, right. But this was many people right. each year, you know, yeah, it just kept really. growing. And what do you remember about the community's reaction to having a community college? Oh. You know, it was very favorable, as I recall. Yes. Uh, you were there, you know, initially, so you'd have a yeah. better idea of it, I think. Well, we ran classes from 3.30 when the high school got out. And our last the last class I ever taught was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 p.m. Wow. Yeah. People came and they- Starting right. at 10? Yeah. Starting at 10. Yeah. Uh, for how at, long? It was Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a full semester. Wow. No, but when did class end? Started at 10 p.m.? No, it's school? not about 4. Oh, Wasn't yeah. it 4, 4.30, yeah. yeah. something like that? 4, 4.30. Okay. Uh, so we had whatever it is, five or six wow. classroom slots. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and of course, however many classrooms we were allowed into in the high school, that's yeah. how many we were able to <coughs> We'd get into the auditorium there um, and haggle. Uh, I need, you know, seven one English 101 sections. Uh, yeah. Well, where are you going to put them? <laughs> you yeah. can only have six okay. uh, because math wanted five, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd go back and forth and. Um, again, no computers, so it was the people sitting there saying, well, you know, well, you know, going back and forth. But um, one of you asked, what was the attitude? Can do. Mm -hmm. That was always, you know, we can do this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can do it. Uh, sometimes it involves scrounging. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Wiley Peckham uh, was the master scrounger. <laughs> um, and proud of it. Um, but, I mean, uh, they got lab tables, they got microscopes, they got, and, yep. you know, uh, they just got things somehow, you know. All of us did, you know, in one way or another. Uh, right. So. And when you opened at CVH, were you simultaneously giving courses still at the high school, or you moved? No, we moved. That course? was it. That's why completely. Wheaton wanted us out of there completely right. to be in CVH, and therefore to provide some embarrassment to the state right. until they provide and us that with. That was 1968, 69. Uh, well, again, we moved. Uh, I think we moved here 72. Okay. Maybe yeah, 73, yeah. My, I don't remember okay, now. Okay, so you were at CVA for yeah. three or four years? Three or four years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other thing about Phil Wheaton, Dr. Wheaton, President Wheaton, is that he had run in some capacity the University of Maryland yeah. um, Germany yeah. uh, system abroad for the military in Germany. So he had a lot of experience pulling things out of yeah. the woodwork. Yeah. Yeah and putting them together, and that's what we did here. Um, yeah, and he brought Brad Biggs along, and eventually Dick Serb. Oh, okay. They both served with him in Germany. Brad Biggs was the uh, Dean of Academics and Faculty. Uh, great big guy. Oh. Lieutenant Colonel, paratrooper, yeah. wounded. The Nichols, double Nichols, wasn't it? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Now, um, you both were here a while. Um, what like friendships or like or, like relationships with your colleagues that do you remember? Like I know uh, James, you traveled with Richard uh, Patrick a couple times. <laughs> no, he traveled with me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. I'm being, yes, he. Tri no, it's true. I ran these trips, yeah. and initially they were just simply. Uh, this, this would be uh, 1980. And the first trip was to London for a theater theater tour, and we had I don't know I had 30 people, and it was very successful. And the students who went had to write essay. You know, we met and they wound up writing an essay, and they received the three credits for for uh, being part of that. And then the second time I ran it again to uh, London the next year, and I got 40 people. And then I ran it the third year, and it So the fourth year, I had um, Paris, Amsterdam. And then, I mean, it just, and then I, oh, that's right, Paris, Amsterdam, and I had 80 people. And again, and then there was a, a, a Spain trip and what have you. And these were all during vacation. We didn't take up, uh, you know, um, back, uh, teaching, uh, cl uh, class time. Now, what years did these, occur, did these trips occur? Oh, until I retired. Well, yeah. After uh, you retired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I've had trips uh, after my retirement. I retired in 97, and uh, but I continued having trips yeah. until the last trip was pre-COVID. Now, uh, what did you like? When did you start doing the trips? Like, what, like, what was the conversation you had to have with like the dean to get like permission? To how it them? happened? Yeah, like, what, like, approve, how did you go about getting approved? Well, I've got an anecdote. You just wanted an anecdote. Here's my anecdote. <laughs> One, I'm at home, and I received a call because I taught dramatic literature as well as other classes. I'm at home, and I receive a call from I can't remember the agency anymore. Uh, Pro Professor Charles, would you like to? run a, a trip to London, uh, a London theater trip. And I said, no. And they said, no. And I said, no. And the <laughs> same person called me maybe two and a half weeks later, Professor Charles, have you reconsidered uh, running a, a, a trip to, you know, because I'd get a free trip and everything. And I said, no, not really. I don't think, thank you though for calling. And then, Maybe another two or three weeks later, the same person calls and says, Charles, we, you know, and I said, okay, <laughs> but only if I can uh, dictate the plays. So I didn't want us to be going, doing Broadway musicals. And they said, okay, and that's how it started. 
And was this field trip um, activity, was this only for a class specifically? Or <coughs> no, I knew that I wouldn't have enough students to go, okay, because they would have to pay their own way. Um, so therefore, I had to immediately offer it to the community. So we always had community students, and that happened, that, that occurred for maybe five, six years. And then for some reason, the, student maybe, uh, the students didn't, uh, weren't as interested or something. Yeah. I don't remember now what happened. In but, faculty. Yeah. I've, I've probably visited, I don't know how many countries you've right. visited, but yeah. I've visited 30 or so with yeah. you yeah. On, on trips uh, all yeah. over the world. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a wonderful thing. How long was it, how long were you at, at CVH before you found out you guys were going to get a campus, a real campus? I think it was after a year we knew that something was happening, yeah. didn't we? Uh, I mean, there were rumblings, right. you know, so, uh, and it was an embarrassment. Um, and we were an independent school. Uh, and all you had to do was look at what Manchester had, what Greater Hartford had, what Norwalk had, you know, even what, you know, yeah. Winnebog had, or, right. you know, wherever, and, and we were low on the total. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it was sorry. really, really, oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah, go ahead. It was very wise of, of Wheaton. Mm -hmm. was very, very smart political perception that he had. Yeah. The other, uh, I don't want to let the moment go without saying that uh, what we've been describing just doesn't happen. Right. 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 <laughs> you know, you don't get a bunch of faculty and a few administrators sitting around a table yep. cooking something up, yep. a college, right. a bunch of policies. Um, so th this was thrilling for us, yep. you know, and when it stopped happening, when we became stable and bigger and more administrative oriented, uh, <laughs> it was a letdown. Um, uh, it was a bandbox. It was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, you asked about friendships. We were all friends, truly. Uh, we were all friends. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking inter-faculty. You know. Uh, we're small enough for that, uh, but Wheaton, very loose leash, and uh, we could be imaginative. And as long as it worked. Yeah, and, that's right. Um, yeah, it wasn't and, illegal. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So. Do you find that there was any component that made you guys really close as colleagues that built those friendships um, like very closely? I'm sorry, just the first part. Like, do you think there was a certain component that really sparked you guys' friendships to be really close oh, to I each see. other? Oh, I see. I think it was just the milieu. I mean, it was just, this is wonderful. I mean, again, as Bill just said, we had carte blanche. Yeah. As long, again, as he said, yeah. as long as it worked. Yeah. Uh, we met constantly. Yeah. And it wasn't always a set meeting that you knew about two weeks ahead of time. It was quick, we need to do this. You know, who, who do we have? You know, let's get together. So we all worked together. And this wasn't just people from an English department working together. That you could sort of expect. You right. know, you'd have a common interest. Um, but um, we worked uh, with a good amount of respect going each way with members from every department. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and we had no choice. Uh, if you have a faculty of nine or 20 and you have the tasks that I was describing to do, you have to work together. Um, and what it pointed out was that some people are good with lists and numbers some people are good with words and ideas. Uh, some people are always late. Some people are always <laughs> early, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And you- Call society. Yeah, <laughs> society. You, you just, 
there were so few of us doing so much all the time that we had no choice but to be friends. You know. I, I can't. Well, we became uh, not less friendly, but uh, you know, I was we yeah. grew and began, again became more institutionalized. Yeah. You know, the faculty just finally right. Uh, it off. right. But it was never, uh, except for a brief period, it was never there was never anything really inimical between departments. Right. But yeah, Jim and I and our wives are going to Charleston day after tomorrow, so we're still friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's and, buying dinner. <laughs> and, and what was it like when they were building the campus? Did you get to come visit? Did you get to contribute? Or no? Yeah, I didn't, no. No, we didn't have to. Um, well, some of the pictures that we were looking at, it was just concrete block, right. yeah. inside and out, <laughs> um, you know, brick on the outside, you know, after the concrete block. Yeah. Slab, too, I think. Slab, yeah. 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 Um, and just one room after another. And uh, um, I can't remember who assigned what, under what circumstances. I know the English department had the. Uh, First room on the left, uh, on the second floor right. of snow. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, then it became too small because, as I said, we had 20 full timers right. at, at one point. Not for a whole lot of years. It just mushroomed, and then the state said, "Whoa, that's a lot of money going out." Mm -hmm. uh, so as people retired or whatever, they they took the full time spot away and filled it with four, you know, uh, adjunct faculty or part-timers. Uh, so uh, at one point, the, the corner office, that room, whatever it is, uh, can't remember, uh, was too small, and so we moved down the hall on the other side to a great big room with a sink in it, which every English department And even needs, then, you know. <laughs> even then there was a trailer right beside Snow Hall for yeah. Was it the art department? I can't remember yes, who it was. The art department, the art department was a large trailer that they moved there because we were just growing. Wow. Yep. Now, how long did it take to uh, complete the new campus after CDH? How long? Like, how long was the construction on the campus? Oh, a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. weren't we weren't at CBH for <laughs> very long. Yeah. <laughs> And we got here in a hurry. It, it was not pretty uh, the first couple of years. Yeah. Uh, walking up and down the hill was torture. Uh, it, it wasn't paved, I don't think. The, no, I don't. I don't the first I, yeah, year, the first know, the first year first it, was, winter, it was gravel. Uh, yeah. It was gravel um, walkway. Uh, and well, you know what it's like in the winter around here. Uh, maybe not. Snow and ice, but you know, wind this year. <laughs> but, um, but it was ridiculous getting up and down the hill. You know. did, did you have the upper lot or no? Yeah, the upper lot. They pretty much. Yes. Basically, yeah. we had the two founders and yeah. and yeah. yeah, the three buildings there. Those were the and then this yeah. was after right. the library. Yeah, I think both were. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the upper lot was about the size that it is now. Um, the, the lower lot, lot was, was expanded yeah. Yeah, considerably. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. so. and, and how did, uh, what was it like on that first day at the new campus, or the first days? I mean, were you, were you thrilled? Were you worried? Uh, I'm sure we were happy. I can't really yeah. remember. I don't think it was, I think it was like, this is really neat, you know, and, and we should be able to do more by having this facility, but I, I really can't remember. I, when you said worried, uh, one thing occurred to me. Uh, the students were worried getting from classrooms at night oh, right. to yep. their cars yep. in the dark. Uh, yep. That's right, there that's true. no lights out there. Right. Um, and so we had to hire more security <clears throat> guards for the nighttime hours until we could get lights. I mean, it's the story of college. <laughs> I mean, that's the same way it happened 10 years prior, you know, scrounging, oh, we need this. <laughs> yeah. so. Oh, one other thing, this as another antigo, many of us smoked in the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's what they, 
you know, until finally, slowly, you know, uh, non-smoking occurred. But then you could smoke outside, so everybody would exit the building and go through this cloud of smoke. Cloud of smoke yeah. And then they finally, you know. So it was always a, you know. Uh, but that's very interesting, uh, sociologically speaking. You know, that, that's what we did. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, the students smoked, didn't they, too, I think? Yeah. 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 Um, so. yeah. Uh, it didn't go on for too, too long. Uh, no. But, you know, uh, Maybe 10 years. So. Yeah. And, and, and how did uh, the new campus, you mentioned something earlier, impact the relationship between faculty members? I mean, compared to the Cape House, all of a sudden you're here. How was it different? Those personal relationships, working relationships, uh, relationship with the administration, and all of that. I think gradually, the growth of each department yeah. in a separate building mm -hmm. uh, led to some of this. And know, classrooms uh, further yeah, apart, yeah. or, or um, faculty departments yeah. further apart. So. Um, I didn't have many classes in Wheaton Hall, just a few, uh, as an English teacher. They were all, almost all up in snow. Um, uh, I can't remember any business classes being run in snow. Uh, so we, right. you know, we didn't see each other uh, uh, as much on a on a day to day basis. Yeah. Meetings and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. but. And, and so Wheaton was president until Chapman, right? Chapman. And, Chapman. Yeah. And, and, and what was the change in administration like? How did the college change? Did there change? Chapman was more a traditional administrator, right. um, um, and a different personality type. Uh, How so? Uh, Whedon was a very smart guy, but he was a goofball also. Yeah. You know, you know he loved to have fun yep. and ham around. And yeah. you'd walk into his office, he might have a cooking pot on his right. head. You know, non traditional. For no particular reason. You know, it's just who he was. Uh, but he knew how to get the best out of yep. people. Uh, he really knew how to work a room. You know, uh, Chapman was. Very straight, you know, uh, play by the rules, um, mm -hmm. and probably good for the college mm -hmm. when he came along. I think the latitude was the same, actually, yeah. between the two of them. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, uh, Chapman allowed us, you know, as long as it works, it's okay. But there was a difference that Chapman was more traditional. And his thinking. Uh, I don't. I don't remember Chapman's background, but I know that Wheaton was uh, um, fine arts and things uh, of that sort. Chapman history. Was it was social history. science. What? Yeah, in social science. Social science. Yeah. 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 And he was president for quite a few years. Yeah. 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 Very nice gentleman. Right. Really, a very nice. Both. Both of them. Very yeah. nice people. Right. And he was succeeded by. Is that what's what's her name? Um, not Hart, but no, Leila. no. I mean, Layla. 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 Gonzalez. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she came on sometime in the eighties, right? Uh, I guess. I'm, I'm, yeah. I. Uh, my memory is. I can recount uh, the president of the United States, but I have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so she was, she was good and lively, uh, and rather different from less latitude. Yeah, less latitude. Uh, I don't and then know, there was Nieves, the right? Nieves. Uh, and he before over, yes, Sue Hart. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I have not much of a read. I, I never. I never really ever saw him, President. I can tell you much about him. I, you know, hi, hello type thing. Yeah. Right, which is a big difference in itself yeah. compared yeah. to the early years. Yeah. 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 No, the colleges were made. The college was made by Wheaton, amplified by Chapman, right. and then maintained by the rest. Right. right. Is that fair? Fair. And, and how many years did you teach part time? 
Well, I, you know, sometimes I'd have an extra course anyway, you know, that type of thing. Uh, no, only about two years after I retired. Okay. And Bill, did you teach uh, Four or five, you know, I, I taught uh, online almost exclusively after I retired, <laughs> you know, full time. You know, I made my own courses. I, I mean, <laughs> I think most people who were here from the beginning have pretty much the same story. We, we, there was no IT person. Yeah. Then there was an IT person yeah. who really didn't understand academics. Mm -hmm. So I shrugged my shoulders and uh, I made my own web page and my own course. It worked sometimes, you know, <laughs> the first semester and then I got better at it um, and better at it. Uh, um, but that's what we did, you know. Uh, challenges. Um, for me personally, um, it, not a negative challenge, but um, I chaired the uh, accreditation uh, process uh, mm -hmm. through te two ten-year uh, accreditations, which was a big deal. Because right. um, if you have a ten-year, then you really don't have to start inventing the wheel again for five years. Right. Uh, the next step down is a five-year accreditation, which means you essentially have to start immediately taking care of what were identified as the problems. Uh, or you could be on probation, which means, boy, you <laughs> have a lot to do. Um, so um, that was, that's a college-wide effort where absolutely everybody participates, you know. Um, and did you have to do that during the early years as well? in the same way, or was it easy? Um, I didn't, uh, I can't tell you offhand when I did it for the first time, uh, but the run up to it was about two years and then it was 10 years, a, a 10 year accreditation, so that's 12, and then um, I did it again, uh, so that was 22 years. Uh, that's most of the time I was here. <laughs> And I, was, I was involved. I beg in your pardon. Hmm? I, was, I said, I beg your pardon. Hmm. Uh, I was chair of the promotions committee for four or five years. I was. Yeah. Nobody is pleased with the <laughs> promotions committee. <laughs> it's. A, I mean, it's a thankless yeah. task. Yeah. Uh, promotions. Yeah. 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 Uh, did you guys have more questions? Um, so early, well, uh, before we leave the interview, we were talking about uh, the athletics programs that used mm -hmm. to be here. Uh, can, you were a former soccer coach. Can you explain like what those were like, like what the funding was? To um, yes. Uh, <laughs> I probably was walking down the hall one day and Marv Hagel, who <laughs> was director of student activities, uh, I forget about uh, said, Bill, <laughs> didn't you used to play soccer in college? I said, well, not on an uh, intramural. He said, <laughs> okay, so you're going to be the soccer coach here. Um, and so I was. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had a bunch of, uh, usually 11. We occasionally played a game with 10, uh, maybe one with nine, um, and we were good for yeah, you two had or three years. One particularly yeah. good year, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, other uh, community colleges, uh, a private school every once in a while, um, uh, guys uh, who were here as students and had played soccer in, in high school. Um, I didn't have much to do with the basketball team and I think that was shorter lived than the soccer actually um, because there just weren't any games to be had and it, you can play soccer on any big, big field, yeah. you know, you, you needed a place to play basketball and I think that was a harder deal. Yeah. Uh, so that was okay. Um, interest increased and waned in, in all of these things, we, you know, not just athletics, uh, we saw the yearbooks and eventually I couldn't get anybody to work on them. And uh, when you guys played soccer, mm. let's say you guys had a home game, did you guys play here or was it like a certain we field? We played at um, 
Vinyl Tech uh, or at Mercy uh, uh, at one of their fields. Yeah. Uh, so there was, and those were our practice fields too. Um, uh, actually, um, what's the field in between Pamicha Palm and Pond and Hunting Hill Avenue? There's a ball field down there. Uh, kidney Park, uh, Pat Kidney Park. Yes, yeah, we practiced in there occasionally. Uh, yeah, so. Now you were the coach for three years, right? Yeah. And uh, like, what, like, was it like your own decision to stop coaching the soccer team, or? I'm sorry. Say again. So you coached for three years. Like, yeah. was it your own decision to stop coaching, or e did you stop coaching when the program just? I think uh, we couldn't field the team. Okay. Yeah, it ran out of gas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if you start with seven and you're begging for two or three more to make almost 11, <laughs> I mean, it, it's just a non-starter, so, yeah. Now, the final question I have for you is, uh, do you have, like, any regrets over your, like, career here at Middlesex or, like, anything that you wish you had done differently? Oh, done differently. God, it sounds cocky, but I don't think I would do anything differently. No, I... I <laughs> I'm really getting emotional. It was a wonderful place to be. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, I've never thought of regrets. Um, there was a lot of learning to do. I showed yeah. up as yeah. a 25, six year old, uh, barely older than the youngest students I had. Um, and I had no knowledge of what a community college was, yeah. or could be, or should be. Uh, and as I was busy telling you, we, we made it uh, uh, what it was in those days. Uh, but we learned, uh, okay, I can write well. I did well in my English courses in college. Now, how do you teach somebody else to do it? Yeah. You know? So that, you know, I, yeah. I had a couple of years experience of, of teaching, but I didn't have, I didn't have a classroom full of 20 to 30 year olds and one 60 year old and an 80 year old grandma in the front seat who would turn around and say, would you please stop? I'm trying to learn something, you know. Um, I mean, there was a dynamic that had to be learned about. Um, I had to learn that the kid who showed up in class with purple lavender spiked hair, can your first reaction, one of the brightest people I've ever met, and one of the most wonderful writers, and it took me a week or two to get over the hair, you know, but it's a learning lesson, you yeah. know, as a, as a teacher. So it, those might be regrets, you know, at the learning process, uh, but it was a good learning process, you yeah. know, so. That's what I would say. Yeah, I would say so. Actually, I have one to show you the, uh, the effect of teaching. At least my personal experience. Is it early on during the Vietnam War, and there was a student in my class, and I could still see him, about four rows up on the window side. His name was David. And uh, whenever I'd call on David, we were, uh, whatever it was, he would say, well, it was okay. <laughs> really, it was like, it's okay. So then we were reading uh, Johnny Got His Gun, and I asked the class, you know, what their feeling was, blah, 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 blah. David, what, how did you respond to Johnny got his gun? Expecting, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> well, he paused and he said, tomorrow I was supposed to enter the Navy and now I can't. 
It's because of the, again, the Vietnam War. Right. This book, this novel affected him wow. in such a way that his life veered. Right. I don't know what happened to him after that, but right. I do know he wasn't in the Navy, so you can imagine the paths not taken. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But that's teaching. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, th I didn't. He was imbued by the novel, but I mean that's the effect on me of yeah. teaching. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we. I wonder how many students there that you never have a conversation with mm -hmm. were impacted by something you said, yeah. and, um, yeah. and you just never knew. Probably yeah. yep. a countless yeah. number. I got two quick. You wanted an sure, no, no. <laughs> uh, One is usable. Uh, that was whatever year early on uh, when four or five Black Panthers showed up in my British literature class. Uh, they were Wesleyan students. Uh, and they came <coughs> to take British literature, but they weren't interested in British literature. They wanted a platform. <laughs> um, and we pretty much agreed that they could have a platform for part of the class as long as I could have the platform back again. These, these guys were scary looking. Mm. I found out the following year that they were arrested for gun running. Mm. You know. So you never knew what you were yeah. <laughs> dealing with. The, the anecdote, a quick one that you probably can't use was, uh, I don't know what the classrooms are like these days, but there were several classrooms that were just filled with desks and you had to worm your way <laughs> in. Um, and in one of those, a woman who was a CVH resident, since we're so, so close, we often got CVH residents down. And every class, at some point in the middle of the class, she'd stand up and say, I got to piss. <laughs> <laughs> and get her way out of the room and then back in. And what are you going to do? You know, um, you have to learn how to... Well, you know, on, on, on that topic, <laughs> speak to the diversity. <laughs> you, know, you know, speak to the diversity of students, because I know when I got here, that's something that really stunned me, is just yeah. the, the, the ages, the background. Yeah. Now we're more traditional age, you know, than we were before, but, you know, you know, what can you tell us about um, that diversity in the student body, not yeah. just ethnic, but age-wise, background-wise, and all of that? Yeah. No, it was... Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I mean can you speak to that? Oh, to um, the, there... If I sat here long enough, I'd remember, you know, little bits and pieces. I mean, there was a, I don't know why I remember that she was 48 years old, but she was. She was South African, um, and she came, and she eventually became a, well, I don't even know what the name of her profession was, um, in New York City. She um, juggled numbers for a, a chemical firm, but she reinvented her life at 48. There was a lot of that going on. Yeah. Um, I taught music appreciation for years and years, just down the hall here, on the other side of the building. And it got me as far away from everybody else as possible with all the music. Um, but there were lots of women in their 30s and 40s. Yeah. Um, who came for the 7 o'clock class or even the 5.30 class, uh, having fed their kids, having three or four kids. And when I talk to them, they say, oh, yeah, I have a full load mm -hmm. of classes, taking four classes, a full-time job, and some number of kids. And I still can't get over it, you know, how they managed, you know. Uh, so. Uh, and I told you about the grandma. That was real story. Yeah, yeah. she shut the class up. Yeah. yeah, you know, just just for the record, so it's on film. Uh, you once gave me from your class a list of the different types of music yeah. and what characterized each one. <laughs> and I still use it. And when I get to a certain part, I take it out and I read it. So that is so it, okay. it's still paying dividends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Did you guys have any more questions? Almost. Yeah, they do. Okay. You're good. 
right. Well, thank you very much, not just for the interview, but for everything you did to help, you know, start this college. And, you know, because if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be sitting here in this wonderful facility right now. And it's yeah. great to hear, you know, how it all started so humbly and, and that it has people like you behind it. And is this going to be on television? This is going to be on all over. What time? The <laughs>